Hello, welcome to today's group class. Uh, we're going to be looking at some A-level content today, uh, specifically from the AMP or the Anatomy and Physiology section. And for today's session, we are going to be looking at the neuromuscular system. So how our brain and our neurological system can actually interact with our muscular system to create movement. How can we actually generate these contractions inside of the muscles using um, you know, outputs from our brain? And how can we alter them? So how do we actually create coordinated movements? How do we adjust the, the strength of contraction or how quickly we decide to move? That's what we're going to be looking at today. So what we'll do is get straight into it and we'll look at some of the objectives of this session. So we should know by the end what the different muscle fibre types are. We should know how the neurons can then control these muscle fibres and then we're going to look at something called a motor unit. What are the different components of it? What are the laws that govern the motor units? Which is the next one there, the all or none law. And then within, within the context of the all or none law, how can we, how can we achieve two different types of, uh, of muscle contraction where we have spatial and wave summation? And then how that can then lead into tetanic contractions. And then once we've done all of those, we will finish off with some work on muscle spindles and GTOs, or Golgi tendon organs. So this, this idea of proprioception and feeling inside of the muscles that can aid how our brain controls them. So we'll start off with the characteristics of different fibre types. Now we have three different types that we need to know. And they are aptly named type 1, type 2A, and then type 2B, or type 2X. So we'll start off with type 1. And these are our slow twitch fibres. These are, they tend to be smaller in size. You know, there's fewer, um, fewer fibres. They they're smaller, they're less densely packed in. And the, the, the aim of them, or the, not, not so much the aim because a muscle doesn't really have an aim, but the properties lend themselves to certain functions. And for our slow twitch muscle fibres, it allows them to contract against low resistances for a long period of time and fight against fatigue. So the properties of slow twitch fibres, which we will look at later on, we're just looking at the, the, the basic characteristics and functions for now. They're, they're there, or we can use them to produce low resistant contractions for an extended period of time without getting early onset of fatigue. So they're ideal, as you can see from the second point just there, they're ideal for marathon runners, for endurance athletes. And perhaps not just ultra-endurance athletes, but any sort of sports performer that requires moderate level of activities for 30, 40, 50 minutes and beyond, these muscle fibres, slow twitch, type 1, they're there and they allow these performers to actually sustain that low level movement. So for example, a basketball player, if they would use their slow twitch muscle fibres when moving around at a you know, brisk walk or a jogging pace all around the court. When they're resting on their, on their team's bench or during timeouts, slow twitch muscle fibres, they have the properties that allow us to recover quickly. So slow twitch fibres, they're great for low force, low contractile output, but for longer periods of time. Our second type, okay, so first type, slow oxidative, type one. Second type, we have fast oxidative, okay, fast oxidative glycolytic, or our fog muscles. You may have heard of them as, as being referred to before. So type 2A fibres, what is the point? What, what are their properties? How can we use them? Well, they're a bit of both. Okay, we're going to look at fast glycolytic in a second, which is the other end of the spectrum. So we've got slow end and we've got ultra fast end. Right now, we're looking at the ones in the middle. They've got a mixture of properties that allow them to do a little bit of both. They've got the properties that allow us to release energy for long periods of time at lower intensities, aerobically. But they've also got properties that allow us to access energy really quickly, anaerobically. These are slightly bigger than our slow oxidative muscle types. They've got bigger fibres, they're, they're more densely packed in. Therefore, with more fibres, there's more muscle to contract so that we can then start to create bigger contractions, higher force outputs. 
So they've got this mixture, as you can see from that second point there. They have structural properties required for both aerobic and anaerobic respiration. They've got a mixture. Now, what this does mean, as or what this does mean, sorry, is that they they won't be the best. So a person with a high proportion of fast oxidative glycolytic muscle fibers, they're probably not going to be an extremely competent performer at, at either end of the spectrum. What they're going to be good at is mixing the two. They'll, they'll be able to adapt to an environment which requires some endurance and some speed and power. This varying environment. So games players, as it says, as it says down in the third point there. So a footballer who has to go from a walk to a jog to a 30 meter sprint to then back into a jog. If we're linking it to training methods, fartlek. You know, that variation in speed and intensity. And our third type, so fast glycolytic or type 2X. These are our powerful muscles. These are the biggest ones with the densest fibers, the ones that we can use to sprint and we can produce rapid, powerful, quick contractions you are with them. Now they're better suited to anaerobic energy pathways. The, the structures and the properties and the, the, the enzymes that they, that they predominantly have are geared towards releasing energy anaerobically. So they're great for explosive sports. They're great for maximal output. High intensity movements, high contractile force, but the trade-off being this far or at this end of the spectrum is there's a lot of fatigue. There's early onset of fatigue. Because we're doing so much anaerobic work, there's a lot of byproduct being produced, such as lactic acid. And as soon as this influx of lactic acid starts to you know, trickle out into the surrounding tissue, that whole muscle will become slower, will become fatigued, and will become less effective in what it's designed to do. So it's great, but for a shorter period of time. So I said, I said earlier how we, we, would, we would look at what these characteristics are. Ignore the table in the middle for the time being. What I want you to look at is the, the column on the left hand side, that darker blue. And you'll notice that they're split into two different sections, structural characteristics and functional characteristics. Well, we just spoke more about the functions. The structure is if you were to take a slab of muscle, be it slow twitch, fast oxidative or fast glycolytic. If you were to take a slab of muscle and look at it under a microscope, the structure is what you can see. It's the physical, undeniable contents of that muscle. How is it built? What's its structure? What's its shape? The function is then what can all of those different properties actually achieve? How does it actually put it into action? So structure is what you can see, it's, it's things, it's stuff. Whereas the functional characteristics is what, it, is what the muscle fiber can achieve, what role it serves in sport. So we'll look at the structural ones to start with. And we've got things like capillaries, the fiber size, myoglobin, storage space is a big one, both for glycogen, phosphocreatine and triglyceride. And I'm hoping you're thinking now, linking this to sort of energy system, or the, what you know of energy systems so far, we use glycogen, we use phosphocreatine, and we use triglycerides. Each one of these three serves as a, as a fuel source for aerobic or anaerobic energy pathways. So the storage space that we can see in a muscle, well, that would, that would then link into the function of, does it suit aerobic or anaerobic energy pathways? If we've got lots of anaerobic fuel, then it makes sense that that muscle can perform anaerobically well, to, a high, to a high standard, let's say. And we've got mitochondria as well, which, again, if we link it to energy systems, where do aerobic and anaerobic pathways take place? Well, we know that anaerobic is in the sarcoplasm. 
the muscular sarcoplasm sort of in the gaps of the muscle, whereas the mitochondria, which are even deeper inside the cells, that's where aerobic respiration takes place. So if we were to look at a slam of muscle underneath the microscope and we could see more mitochondria in one type compared to another type, well, the one with more mitochondria is going to function better aerobically because it's got more places to actually respire aerobically. So we should start to see this link between what the structures are and then how that muscle functions in action. So now we can look at the sort of the high, medium, low. And it's we, when, whenever we're looking at muscles and talking about different fibre types, we always need to talk in relation to others. Because for, for example, you don't just want to say that slow oxidated muscle fibres have small fibres or low density. Well, compared to what? If we're talking about you know, the comparison of type 1 to type 2A, it's not going to be that much of a difference. So we always need to be comparing the types of muscle fibres and the characteristic we're talking about. So yes, I put here high, medium or low, or small, medium or large, but when you're talking about them in the exam and comparing them and evaluating the relevance of them in different contexts, it's better to use language such as smaller, larger, greater, higher, in comparison to the other. And that's, that, that's what will allow you to get even more analytical. So we won't go through all of them now, but you have that slide there to, 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 really, to really go into detail in your own study. But look at, the, look at the characteristics and then the functions, then make the comparisons. So just one example, if we do look at the myoglobin quantity, well, the slow muscle fibers, slow twitch type 1, they've got the highest quantity of myoglobin compared to the others. Therefore, if we look at the functions, well, it's, got, it's also got the highest fatigue resistance. Because with myoglobin, we know, comes better oxygen delivery which means better aerobic respiration capabilities. So they all start to link up. Whereas if we look at the other end of the spectrum, which one's got the, the lowest myoglobin quantity? It's the type 2B, the fast glycolytic, those explosive anaerobic muscles. Let's look at the fatigue resistance. Well, type 2B has the lowest fatigue resistance because it hasn't got the myoglobin to help combat lactic acid production, to access aerobic energy pathways sooner. So that, that table there is a great tool for you to use just to, to quickly get a snapshot in one place of how these different muscles compare. So if you do want to break away now, you do have three activities to do there. Uh, linked with you know, looking at the comparison of those muscle fibres that we just talked about and then applying it to sport. So there's that long jumper example there. Which fibre would, would, fiber suits a long jumper? Which fibres do they want to train? If we just talk about natural ability, what performer with what proportion of muscle fibres that they've inherited, what proportion would they want to have inherited if they want to be good at long jump? And then question three, explain the structural characteristics of type one muscle fibers that would make them the preferred type for endurance athletes. So if you want to have a bit of a timeout breakout, go and, and have a go now. If not, we're gonna carry on. So contracting a muscle, the neural control of muscular contraction. Well, we've got this, this word on that first line there, impulses. The central nervous system can send and it conducts and it transmits impulses where we've got the, the slight variation in chemical and electrical charge throughout sort of the length of a motor neuron. Think of it like a wire or a cable. And with these slight variations in chemical balances inside this wire, inside the neuron, we're actually able to, almost like Chinese whispers, send this electrical charge along this motor neuron from the brain, where we almost knock that first domino over, 
and we change a chemical balance inside the brain, which then causes the ripple effect along that motor neuron, eventually that neuron is going to reach whatever it's being, you know, whatever it's meant to be stimulating. And in this, you know, in the context of this lesson, we're talking about muscle fibers. So the brain emits an impulse, which then travels along a motor neuron and then arrives at the muscle site. And once it's there, once it's at the muscle fiber, we've got something called this action potential threshold, or activation threshold, as you might also refer to it as, and which basically says this impulse needs to hit the muscle with a certain magnitude or with sufficient would be a better word, a sufficient magnitude that's high enough, great enough, powerful enough to actually jump into the muscle and to cause the next set of chemical reactions to take place. Now think of it almost like you're hearing. You know, your, your eardrums, they have, to, they have to experience a certain level of sound wave frequency and height. They have to experience a certain loudness in order for it to register for you to actually hear it. Doesn't mean that there wasn't a sound before. You know, ultrasonic, for example. We can't hear that. Doesn't mean that it's not occurring, but it just doesn't register. It doesn't cause any changes inside our ear so that we hear it. Well, same with our muscles. The impulse, this action potential that has been sent along the motor neuron, it has to be of a certain magnitude of size to register at that muscle fiber site and to cause the next reaction, to cause the next chemical response, which will then eventually lead to this muscle contracting. So our brain, yes, it might be emitting impulses, but an important thing for it to, to consider, if I just move myself out of the way here, just, just so you can see the rest of the picture. We have the brain there, that sort of, that yellow, yellow section almost, and these motor neuron wires plugged in, and they travel towards this muscle fiber. Now what you'll notice here, we're gonna talk about this in a, in a little bit more detail now, is that phrase there, motor unit. You can see there, there's two colors, purple and red motor neurons, and they're supplying separate muscle fibers. That creates a motor unit. We're gonna talk about that in a moment now. But the main thing that I sort of wanted to get across on this slide here was this idea of threshold and impulses being emitted to the muscle fiber arriving at this junction point, this junction between neuron and muscle, also called the neuromuscular junction. And in order for that impulse to jump across or to cause the chemical reactions that allow the next stage to start, we have to, we have to reach that activation threshold. The action potential must be great enough Otherwise, it wouldn't work. So, the motor unit. Well, it's this, it's the complete circuit. The motor unit is brain, motor neuron, and the fibers that it innovates. The fibers that it's connected to and has the potential to activate. If a muscle fiber isn't connected, oh, no, rewind. Let's say we have motor neuron A, B, and C. Motor neuron A is connected to five muscle fibers. B is connected to five different muscle fibers. C is connected to five other different muscle fibers. Now, if an impulse travels down motor neuron A, only the five connected to it will respond. The other 10 connected to B and C, they won't respond because they're not plugged into it. You know, think of it like electricity, wires, the different things that you can plug into the wall. If you plug one laptop into one plug socket in the wall, but you then flick on a switch on a different plug socket, it's not in the same circuit. That laptop isn't going to charge. But if you flick on the right switch that is connected to the laptop, it will charge. So when we talk about a motor unit, it's that circuit, it's that complete section that's all linked up. 
Because we've got thousands, hundreds of thousands of motor neurons and hundreds of thousands of muscle fibres. But every time we send an impulse, we don't want all of them to switch on at once because that would just create the exact same contraction every single time. So by having this variety of different motor units, we can start to select which ones we switch on or off to create different sequences. I've often linked it to sort of going on the line of um, electrical circuits. Imagine you had a bank, let's say I had a bank, I tell you, I can even, I can even draw this on, a, on the whiteboard, there we go. Imagine we had, these are all light switches, and we had a board, okay, let's say in a sports hall, okay, that's, that's, often, that's often a good example because there's often a, a place in your sports hall at school and there's a whole row of light switches that everyone just loves to, loves to switch on and off if they get the chance. Well, each one of these is connected to its own set of lights. And obviously when all of the light switches are on, all of the lights that they're connected to are also switched on. But if we start to play around and we switch up the sequence, we start to get a different output because some of the circuits are switched on while others are switched off. And we can start to adjust how much we light up the sports hall, where gets the most light, where gets no light, by altering which ones we switch on and off. So now if we were to link this to the body, well if we were doing a bicep curl, we well, that's a bad example. If we wanted to do a dart throw, let's say, we're probably not going to switch on our quadriceps. Obviously, we're holding our body upright as we throw, but we're not going to switch on our quadriceps. We're probably not going to switch on our latissimus dorsi. We're not going to switch on our hamstrings. We are going to switch on our triceps. Now another important thing to note with this is that each motor unit isn't just one muscle. Because if our whole tricep was connected to one switch and we flicked that switch on and we contracted the whole tricep, every single tricep extension is going to be maximal. So if we're playing darts, we've got no, we've got no variation. It's always going to be thrown at the same speed. So don't just think of this as sort of a light switch board for your whole body, but think of this for every muscle. So now if we want to do a delicate, uh, a delicate dart throw, we might switch on one motor unit, a second motor unit, and that's it. So we've got two out of the six motor units switched on. That's going to create a different sort of contraction, a different movement action compared to if we were to switch all of them on, or four of them on, or number two and four on, instead of five and one. So we can start to play around with how much of the muscle and which parts of the muscle are innovated and excited and end up contracting. A motor unit is this complete circuit made up of the brain, the motor neuron and the fibres that it touches and innovates and excites. Now a larger motor unit, which, so the motor neuron which is connected to more muscle fibres, when that impulse is sent and it reaches the activation threshold on all of the fibres, that's going to produce a larger movement, a more, con a more forceful movement. Whereas a motor unit that's smaller, where we want more delicate, precise movements, such as dexterity in our hands. Now the motor units controlling my index finger probably couldn't perform a pull-up by themselves. 
but it can write, it can produce you know, movements with millimeter precision, because the, 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 there's, there's more variation available, because the motor units involved with the muscles that control my hand, one neuron might only, might only control two fibers, but there might be a hundred motor neurons going to my hand. So I've got a hundred light switches to potentially switch on and off to create different muscular outcomes. Which leads us into something called the all or none law, which is where, like a light switch, it's on or off. That activation threshold is either going to be met and surpassed, or it's not. And when we're talking about motor units, the activation threshold needs to be met in all of the fibres, and if it is, all of the fibres contract fully. The whole, the, the, the next chemical process, you'll probably look at it in, in greater detail, not in this lesson, but it's something called the sliding filament theory. You know, a series of chemical reactions which lead to the fibres sliding over each other, shortening the muscle. That doesn't happen slowly or 50% or halfway. It happens or it doesn't happen. And as soon as the impulse that arrives at the muscle is big enough and it crosses that neuromuscular junction, that next chemical reaction happens or it doesn't. So all or none law. If the impulse is big enough, then all of the fibres will contract completely or they won't, if the impulse isn't big enough. That is linked to our light board, or our light switch board. If you flick a switch, it's on. There's, you can't hover it in between. There's no way, it's not, it's not a dimmer switch. You know, it's not one of the things that you turn and you can increase the intensity of, of that light. It's on or off, all or none. So, we're going to hold it there for today. So, some things that you can, some, or things that you can go away uh, to do now and sort of solidify your understanding is a little bit of work on motor unit. Just re revisit these slides, go through the content in detail, read through it, understand it, and just get almost get this picture in your mind of what a motor unit is. This circuit. Impulses are sent by the brain delivered by the motor neuron, arriving at muscle fibres. Any fibre that it, that it connects to forms the motor unit. In order to activate all of those muscle fibres, the activation threshold must be met. If it's not met, none of the fibres contract. If it is met or surpassed, all of the fibres contract. Those fibres come in three different types. Type one, slow twitch, low density, better for aerobic, um, aerobic pathways. Type 2A, fast oxidative glycolytic. And type 2X or type 2B, fast glycolytic. Each of them have the same properties but just in different proportions. And those different proportions and sizes and quantities determine the functions of that muscle. How can it serve a performer within sport? And that is about that. That was a very quick run through of, of what we've looked at today. But have a look at this timer. Have a look at the breakout. Look at those questions. Go back to the other one as well, if you haven't already. And obviously, you can skip back through this presentation and revisit some of those slides as well. So I hope you found that lesson useful. That was sort of an introduction and, and sort of the part of the neuromuscular system as a whole. Uh, next lesson we will be looking at the the second half or the, the final third more likely, uh, the final third of the, of the neuromuscular system and then we'll be moving on to the next bodily system in the specification. So I hope you found that useful. Um, if you want to learn more about where you can find presentations like this or the resources that go with it, head over to the petutor.com um, where you can learn more about one-to-one -one group classes uh, which are launching very soon, um, as well as the resource and YouTube channel as well. So, 
grateful or oh, glad, glad it was helpful, great that you could join us and I look forward to well delivering a lesson to you soon.